to the second triage chat with experts. My name is Isidora Salim, and on the behalf of triage projects, I welcome you to this session. I would also like to welcome all the teachers and schools and students that join us today. Uh, we're very happy to have you. And uh, for today's session, we have our expert Luisa Ferreira Bastos, and we also have Marcel Holloway from GRC. And today I will be your moderator. And we will start with the introduction of the three hours project from Marcel Holloway, and then we'll go to the chat itself and you can ask our expert everything you want. Marcel, I now leave the floor to you. You can start with your presentation and inform us about three hours, what it is and how it's useful for us. OK, thank you very much, uh, Isidora. And um, it's a pleasure to be here, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's fantastic that so many of you have been able to join today. Um, I will now. There we go. OK, I'm going to introduce to you our three hours education project and uh, talk a little bit about what the three hours are. And I will try to not be too long because we are keen to get on to our, um, our careers chat uh, guest today, Louisa. So first of all, I'm Marcel Holloway. I work at the European Commission. I work in a research center, which is part of the European Commission, the Joint Research Center, and it is the science and uh, knowledge service of the European Commission. We are based in five countries, five member states, over six sites. And um, we are based in a little corner of Europe, uh, in Italy, in the north, Lago Maggiore. And I work at the European Union Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing, uh, known as ECVAM for short. And we work on the validation of and research into non-animal testing methods, so animal-free methods. And we work on the dissemination and promotion of those methods as well. And the good application of the three R's, the replacement, reduction and refinement of animal use in science. We also do a number of education projects, including a summer school for young scientists, which is very popular. And we and this project that I'm going to speak to you about today, where we want to try to introduce the three R's into the education programs of secondary schools. Um, so the three R's, um, animal use in science, I will start with that. So what are we talking about when we talk about animal use in science? Um, it refers to animals which are used in basic and applied research development and production of medicines and testing of chemicals, food additives and other products to make sure they're safe. So we are talking about, for example, vaccine development, vaccine testing. Anyone using the using animals in science must apply the three R's under EU law. And we have a directive in place. We've had it in place for about 10 years. And it's one of the strongest pieces of legislation in the world for the protection of laboratory animals. Um, it's mandatory to use replacement methods under this directive if they are available. And there's a strong emphasis in the legislation on the development of replacement methods. <clears throat> Animal testing is banned in the EU, um, but it's under different legislation, but it, it does take place uh, in other places in the world. Um, I will talk a little bit more about this in another slide. So what is replacement reduction refinement of animal use? Well, we have quite an impressive toolbox to draw upon these days for replacement methods. And these include um, such methods as in vitro, in glass approaches, where tissues and cells produced or cultured in a lab are used. We have computational modeling methods where data is processed processed to try to predict the effects of substances on organisms. We can do this through artificial intelligence and algorithms as well. And we have um, these little interesting devices that you may have heard about last week, microfluidic devices or organs on chips. This is cutting edge technology, which uh, my colleague spoke about last week in the careers chat, Monica, using human cells to, to also try to um, uh, 
predict uh, what substances are going to do or try to develop uh, medicines and drugs and so on and so forth. Reduction is all about reducing to the absolute minimum the number of animals needed in your experiment. So um, you probably have concluded by now that we still allow the use of animals in science, but we try to draw into focus the other two R's, the reduction and refinement. So you can reduce the number to the minimum through good experimental design, um, while still uh, obtaining the, the results that you need or answering your research questions, which is very important because you don't want to redo the experiment and therefore use more animals. You can also reduce the number of animals by blending together replacement methods and animal methods in a research program. Overall, in that case, you have reduced the number of animals. And refinement is all about um, good housing and care practices of animals. Um, and this is also detailed in the directive. And treating the animals well when they are used in procedures with uh, correct uh, anesthetic and analgesic, painkillers, etc. And here I just put, put a couple of pictures, I hope you can see them, of how refinement might look in a lab setting for animals used uh, in the lab or in a, in a scientific procedure. So the pigs are, are grouped together, which is correct for, for this animal with a bit of uh, a toy in there, which would represent enrichment. And then the rat has some bedding and some burrowing material in the cage. And the mouse is um, being handled in a tube, which is um, agreed these days to be one of the best ways to handle mice rather than picking up by the tail or the scruff of the neck, the back of the neck. And then in the last picture, you see some rabbits together in their group uh, with hopping platforms. So they hop up, they hop down. This is very important for rabbits to have in their enclosure. So that's just some examples to show you. But why are the three R's important and why, why do we have this project running to try to teach or teach teachers about the three R's so they can introduce to, to the students? Well, for a number of reasons, but I just um, picked out the main ones. For, for animal welfare reasons, of course, we, we don't want to have to use animals in science. Animal welfare is a European value. It's mentioned in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Um, and the EU's ultimate goal is to phase out the use of animals. And this is, this is mentioned in the directive as well, although we don't have a timeline for this at the moment. And of course, citizens and politicians support uh, good animal welfare. Um, we have the legislation I talked about. Um, it's mandatory to apply the three R's in research and testing. So it's important that people are aware of the legislation and that this has to be adhered to in a in a scientific uh, environment or setting. And, and if you go um, follow a career path in the, in the area. And for innovative science in, and human relevant science reasons. So human relevant science, for example, the organ on a chip using human cells is going to produce um, better and more relevant results than studying mouse biology, for example, to translate to the human situation. So we want to move towards this, this better and more sustainable type of science. And jobs and careers, yes. Um, some of these new tools and technologies there based on human models are shaping job opportunities of the future. For example, organ on a chip again and data analytics, data science, artificial intelligence and machine learning and so on. So what can we offer now to teachers? So we, we have a lot of material that we can offer already. I know now some teachers present today have taken part in our MOOC. This was um, a MOOC to train teachers to teach three hours in the classroom. This took place last year in September, October and was um, very well um, attended and appreciated. So we based it on three main modules looking at animal welfare and science, human based science and critical thinking. And all the material is still available. You can still log in and find it. 
um, but it will be transferred soon to um, to a learning platform of the European Commission and it will always be findable and also other other target audiences will be included in there and they can follow the course. Um, and we have six finalized learning scenarios. They all talk about the three R's, but they approach the three R's from a different angle and they incorporate different disciplines because it doesn't only cover science, but you, you can also teach this topic in, uh, in other classes such as mathematics or citizenship or um, social studies or, or something like that. So I think a lot of you will know what a learning scenario looks like. This is this is a couple of examples and in there is a lot of support for the teacher. So if you're not completely familiar with the three hours, it doesn't matter because everything you need, in fact, is contained inside the learning scenario. And very soon we will have more of these and more resources as well. At the moment, um, we have some resources, but we are producing more. And very soon, in fact, in April next month, we will have a dedicate, dedicated web page that will include all of our um, material. Our age range is six years to 19 years. So I invite you to take a look at that in a couple of weeks and to uh, start preparing your lessons on the three hours in the classroom. And with that, I will stop talking and <laughs> we are keen to hear from Louisa and I would like to thank her very much for agreeing to take part in, in this career chat and we look forward to hearing from her now. So thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Holloway. Uh, Marcel. Oh, so, so sorry. Thank you very much, Marcel. No problem. Um, before I continue to our speaker, I just want to ask you to, when you post your questions in the chat, write the name of your school as well, so we know from where the question is coming for, so we can um, refer you to it as well. Uh, now I will introduce our today's speaker, Luisa Ferreira Bastos. Uh, she's a program leader of Eurogroup for Animals, which is an animal advocacy umbrella NGO. And she represents more than 80 organizations all around Europe. Um, aside from that, Luisa has a PhD in biomedical engineering and a master's in computational methods and a licentiate in applied mathematics. She's a board member of European Consensus Platform for Alternatives to Use of Animals in Science and the Center of European Parliament that are interested in accelerating transition to the science without animal experience. And without further ado, Luisa, you have oh, you have the floor. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for, for having me here today. It's really a, a pleasure to participate in such a fantastic initiative, um, especially with such a, such a special partner as, uh, uh, as the Joint Research Centre's uh, ECVAM. So thank you. Um, so as, um, as you heard, I'm the programme leader um, for Animals in Science at uh, Eurogroup for Animals. Um, this umbrella organization ha is, um, works with a membership model, so our members are other animal advocacy NGOs uh, in Europe and also beyond. And uh, within my role, I'm responsible for the organization's policies in, um, in the area of animal and an animal research. Um, and together with my colleagues, I build advocacy and policy strategies and, uh, and put them in, uh, in practice. Um, so today my job is to look at the scientific, the political and the societal landscapes um, in the EU and identify opportunities and define some strategies that can help us to transition to scientific practices that do not use animals uh, to innovative advanced approaches that uh, Marcel so very well mentioned that are more uh, based on uh, on the human bio biology and physiology and to help us to understand better uh, human disease and how to tackle it. Uh, but how does this connect to STEM? Um, you heard that I am, uh, I am in my basic studies, I am an applied mathematician. 
um, and in that uh, in that course, I, I learned to apply mathematical skills to help solve problems of uh, of healthcare. And there, I decided that I wanted to to be a researcher and build models that could help save some lives. So I followed um, a PhD in biomedical engineering um, and I joined a, a fantastic team that together built um, a life-saving birthing simulator that is now in, in the market for training uh, healthcare professionals. Um, and it was also during uh, the, the work in this simulator that I came into contact with uh, quite some um, some animal studies. So I I was modeling at the time uh, fetal asphyxia, which is uh, uh, one critical scenario, uh, one critical event that can happen, fortunately, very rarely during uh, during labor. Um, but that can can be very critical for uh, for for the baby and needs to be uh, uh, approached uh, with um, very effectively in a, in a very short time. And so it's uh, it's not something that you can just find out uh, very it, how to say there's not so much um, uh, clinical research done in such situations because it's very difficult. To uh, to approach these uh, these issues and uh, and so I turned to uh, studies in other species other than humans to try to figure out what happens during uh, um, an asphyxia episode of uh, of a fetus and uh, it was through those um, decades of of research getting a bit into that that I understood. Um, that it was not that easy to translate. Um, animal research to uh, human healthcare. There are a lot of barriers um, for that translation. And because I was also already sensible to uh, to to the way that we relate to other animals. And um, well, eventually this brought me to this role. Wow, that was a very interesting path you had and very interesting research you worked on it. I would really like to hear more about what you did with the incub incubators and everything you did for healthcare research. I, but that is for me. <laughs> we can continue with the chat. Um, our students would actually want to know, um, since they are secondary school students, uh, they would also like to know how they can pursue the careers for uh, like you what bachelors they can take. You said you were you had bachelors in applied mathematics, but what other uh, bachelor degrees they can pursue in order to continue go into advocacy and on which fo uh, st subjects they should focus even now? Um, well, it's very broad. <laughs> So the um, the skills that you can bring to a position like uh, like this and to to advocacy or policy in general, um, it's very broad. Of course, that if you if you follow studies in in biology, in toxicology, um, in in any area that has to do with life science, even as a veterinarian, for example, it's always very useful to have that expertise, scientific expertise in a, in this uh, in this field. And it's um, it's probably the the rarest uh, the rarest uh, that you also have. It's difficult to find people with this uh, with these backgrounds that want to work on um, on on advocacy. So I think that's that's always very valuable. Uh, but then on the side, it's also important to explore other 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 paths and other other areas um, as um, political science uh, or um, the critical thinking. And with that, you already have quite some materials from the Joint Research Center uh, too. So I, I would also very much um, advise to uh, to explore 
those uh, those materials that the Joint Research Center has developed to uh, um, attend also when the time comes, because I know you're still in secondary school, to attend their summer schools on uh, non-animal approaches and uh, and also just look at the variety of courses that uh, that are available in the EU in the three hours because the Joint Research Center also has put together a database on those uh, on those resources. Um, and I think that for now, that's a good start. Yeah, that's quite a lot, <laughs> more than good, a good start. Um, they also asked, um, especially the school, ninth school, uh, Rodriguez de Feritas from Porto, asked, why is um, math so important for your work? Yeah, yeah, very good question. And from my hometown, so a big heart to Porto. Um, well, you know, when I when I when I chose mathematics, I really wanted to find out okay, what does this uh, why is math so important? You would hear from from uh, from teachers all the time that mathematics is in every aspect of our life. It's very important on everything, but I didn't really get a grip on why and how. So I followed applied mathematics to find that out, and um, and so for the work that uh, that I did. Um, what I did in practice was to translate what goes on in our body into mathematical equations that then pass to uh, are translated into computer programs to run simulations. And these simulations, what they what after uh, you have these models and simulations, you need to incorporate these uh, these these uh, these uh, programmable equations, let's say. Um, into into in in, the, in my specific case into a, a full sized mannequin of uh, of a human, and the models will give life to this mannequin. For example, um, I I I, uh, I model also drug effects on uh, on uterine contractions. For example, so you can give uh, a drug to a patient, to the, to the mannequin while training on the mannequin, and you will see the uterine contractions increasing in intensity and frequency, and then maybe that's too much and it's provoking stress to the fetus, and so you need to administer one drug that will decrease the, the those uterine contractions, and so you also have to model the interactions between two drugs because then you have two drugs in the system that interact with the with each other. And so this is uh, this this is applied for uh, it's such a so tiny little example. But then you have the circulatory system, you have the respiratory system, and all of these can be translated into math. And then you can model the real world um, virtually. And make experiences and experiments uh, to figure out what happens in which cases. So there's also this. Uh, there are um, these uh, fantastic projects that aim to build uh, virtual human beings, where you basically have every system of uh, of the human being in a in a computer model, and can, for example, explore what will be um, the best. How can you perform, for example, the, the uh, a heart surgery in the best way for a specific patient to have the better outcome before performing the surgery in the patient? This is absolutely magical. I completely agree. <laughs> um, but our students from Czechia would want to know, actually, why did uh, you decide to sp support this uh, career path? Why did you choose it? And our students from Italy are asking if you're satisfied with your achievements. Uh, yes, well, uh, why did I choose this? Well, it was really um, a combination of, um, of two big passions in my life. I think it was science and advocacy. So I was, um, I was a researcher and a teacher in a, in a university in Porto. Um, but I was also um, a, an advocate. I, I in, in several causes, not only on animal advocacy, but also in uh, social justice uh, issues. 
And um, but I had a very special call for animal advocacy because I, I always uh, had um, this uh, uh, tendency to care uh, for animals even since primary school. Um, and, uh, and because of what I've learned during uh, my research uh, path that made this um, fantastic combination between these two worlds that, uh, that I was involved in. And that's how I ended up uh, being a, a program leader in an animal advocacy NGO, um, joining this, these two passions. If I am satisfied, this was the other question, right? Um, yes, I'm very satisfied. I thought when I realized that I wanted to do this, um, I thought it would be very difficult to, um, to, to, uh, to get such a position because they are, they are rare in, uh, in the EU. Um, but I was so very lucky uh, to to find this uh, this place and uh, very honestly at Eurogroup for Animals I really feel feel uh, at home as uh, I I found my chosen family in life. That's very nice and working on what you love it's always always a good thing. Um, our students from Italy are also so asking how are you staying motivated to do what you do? How are you because it's a very difficult path and a very long path. So how are you staying motivated? What gives you satisfaction and joy in all of it? Um, well, throughout I, I will talk a little bit of how it was throughout my career path and and more about uh, about this job because there are um, the different realities. I think I was always um, I was always very lucky to be passionate about what uh, what I was doing. I always tried to find projects that I liked and I loved. And so when I was uh, working in um, in developing simulators for healthcare, I loved that area. And uh, yeah, sometimes there are those uh, phases of research that can get a little bit boring, and you're not really um, when you're not really finding anything new, but you are more uh, concerned about communicating for example um, but I always found a lot of motivation on the overarching picture uh, so I always um, uh, I, I was modeling and I was primarily a mathematical modeler but I wanted to know everything about the practice around those models that we were building, where are they going to be used? Who's going to use them? How are they seeing these models? What, what is the value that these models can bring to, uh, to in this case, to the training of healthcare providers? Um, and what are the different kinds of uh, environments in simulation of, uh, of, uh, of teams that will use or individuals that will use these models? So there are so many questions all the time that you can explore that and that makes things very differently and in this uh, in this job it's um sometimes it's tough because you're um, um you're always dealing with uh, with the suffering of others and you are trying to do something to diminish that suffering but still you need to deal with the suffering and the existence of uh, of this uh, of this suffering, but also the goal that we have of improving that situation and having your eye on the final goal of um, fully replacing the use of animals in science sooner than later, um, always uh, gives you the energy and uh, motivation to uh, to do your best. Thank you. That's a very Nicely put. Um, we received also a question from Spain. It was by email before the chat, and they are interesting to interested to know what characteristics cannot be missing from a person who wants to do <laughs> research and career in three hours. Um, what cannot be missing? That's a, a very good question. Openness. I would say openness. You need to be open to learn beyond um, your own interests, your own views, your own values. Um, I think you need to be open to understanding every 
every stakeholder, every group involved, every every individual that is involved in um, in the practice of animal research or non animal methods, understanding uh, understanding their positions, understanding the the practices themselves, and uh, and that will give you, I think. Um, um, a good overview to think critically about the the problem and the problems that each groups are facing to try also to together to uh, to tackle them. But how did you know that this was the right option for you? Uh, well, as I said, I was already involved in advocacy and also in animal advocacy. I started in uh, doing some work, volunteer work uh, on animal advocacy on entertainment um, to to try to uh, to end the use of uh, of animals in circuses. Uh, I remember I was uh, involved in a petition in Portugal on that. Um, and so I, I was I was already quite uh, familiar with um, with this uh, with this world of advocacy of uh, also I was involved in in political uh, activities so this is, was something that also fulfilled me a lot and um, when my research sparked that little light or little seat that I had in me regarding animals in science. I also understood that animals in science are very much um, neglected in the animal advocacy world. Um, it's not that easy to find uh, groups that are, um, are working in this area, not as much, of course there are groups, but if you look at the dimension of the advocacy world, animals in science is usually the smallest the smallest group and uh, and I thought well I need to do something about this <laughs> so I yeah I jumped into it and uh, not professionally at the beginning we uh, we had some uh, some very good uh, activities in uh, in Portugal uh, in this uh, in this area but then I I wanted to do um, something more I wanted to make this my my main uh, my main uh, um, activity in uh, in life, and that's how I decided to um, to to follow this path. Thank you. Um, our students from Italy totally want to know: Aren't you afraid of failure? What? How are you dealing with it? Have you failed in something before do, in your career? And how how did you overcame it? I'm afraid of failure every single day. <laughs> I think that's also what drives uh, one of the parts that uh, that that drives my my motivation. It's uh, yeah, it's always a possibility, and I'm always uh, because it's such it's a topic where I feel so deeply about. It's difficult to uh, to feel that um, failure is a possibility. Um, but I really don't, um, I mean, I use that as fuel to, uh, to, to, help, to help me and to help the, the community succeed. Because of course you always have bumps in the way and things will go wrong here and there. But from my experience here and in my past, you're always going to achieve something good if you are persistent enough um, and so it's uh, yeah the the fear is there but the the positivity of this is possible this is what citizens want this is what scientists want this is what policymakers want it's just a question of thinking of how we will get there together that's a very good point. Thank you. Um, our students from Liceo Diaz Caserta, they're asking if you wanted to uh, help people. Why did you then choose maths and not medicine? <laughs> very good point. Well, maybe when I chose math, I was not really thinking if I wanted to help people. So when I was, uh, so it's, uh, it's 17 when you need to make a choice on the path, well, a little bit before, because in the secondary school, you already need to choose something. And um, at that age, I had absolutely no clue what I wanted to do. 
Um, earlier, when I was uh, younger, I, I did uh, think I want to be a veterinarian. Uh, so again, the connection to the animals was uh, was always there, but I I thought at the time that that would be a bit difficult um, to for me to deal with, and in my studies uh, I was always fascinated with mathematics, um, and as I said, I really wanted to figure out how uh, mathematics could help uh, society. Uh, because teachers would say that a lot, but I, I, I didn't really understand how. And so at that young age, I, um, yeah, I followed mathematics um, because I was curious. And then from there, there, um, as I grew up, as I would uh, experience new things and come in contact with different people, different groups, different projects, I was able to, to choose each step of the way, where, where was my uh, gut driving me? So listening your guts and not being, not knowing at the beginning what you want is also okay. Oh yes, it's very okay, and I know it doesn't feel okay. You know, <laughs> I didn't feel uh, comfortable at all at making a choice uh, in such a young age, um, but. Um, but whatever you choose, um, it's um, one of one very important thing I found out is that whatever you choose, um, it will not define who you are. It will be something that you will do and will help you grow as a person, grow with every experience that you that you make, and to help you to make further decisions as you go forward. Yeah. Um, but can you tell us what are your main duties during on your workday? What is what do you do during your work? What are your main tasks? Yeah, briefly, uh, you can explain. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, no, but um, uh, very briefly. So we we take on um, certain priority projects, uh, for example, where we try to um, influence, we may try to influence legislation. If, for example, the legislation is open to revisions, uh, we uh, we may want we may want to um, to 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 improve the way that legislation is uh, implemented because legislation is so very nice and well, but sometimes the implementation part is uh, is uh, is quite difficult. And so facilitating better implementation of legislation, for example, the some of the legislation that Marcel mentioned in her presentation for the protection of animals used in uh, in scientific procedures. Um, we uh, we also engage with uh, with scientists um to um to try to understand where not only where science is to we may want to uh, disseminate for example some of the fantastic work that the joint research center has uh, has done to the scientists and also to funding bodies because funding bodies play an um, enormous role on the scientific path that uh, that we will take uh, in the in the EU, um, and uh, and we we also uh, work with uh, with politicians, for example, uh, where we may want to influence or gather support for uh, for measures that can facilitate a transition to non-animal science. So I think, in a nutshell. When you said now, when you're mentioning the transition to a non-animal science, our students from Italy and are actually asking, is uh, tr a transition to science without animals really uh, possible? And how c far have we come? And do you think there are some countries that are less prone to change? Well, I know there are some countries that are more prone to change than others, definitely. Uh, if it's possible, it is possible, um, but it's uh, it's really how we um, how we tackle the problems and how we we see the problems um, that we will uh, that we need to to solve. It's uh, um, our behaviors and our our practices. They are 
um, very much based on, on, on the values of our society. And I, I, I do not think that um, the scientific solutions are the, um, the only um, the only aspects that we need to tackle. We also need to tackle those values because only together they will actually um, promote some change. For example, there was a very, very uh, a mediatic case um, and very sad case uh, in the in the beginning of this year on xenotransplantation. I don't know if you saw where um, the heart of a pig was used to um, to, to to transplant to um, to a, a patient that was in a very critical stage, and then uh, I think a month later he ended up dying. But um, one day after the operation, it was all in the media that well, fantastic success, we managed to to do this. Um, and what came out in the media was well, we now may have a solution for organ transplantation, because it is a very, very um, difficult issue in, uh, in the world. There are not um, enough, um, enough donors to, uh, to, for the list of patients that are waiting for, for new organs. But the way that we tackle this problem is very based on the values that we have and on the relationships that we have established with the with the with the animals and with the and with the other humans. We can look at a solution as building a factory of uh, genetically modified pigs that are used to uh, to to uh, harvest organs to human patients and that has failed for a long time. We have like 50 years of failure of, uh, of xenotransplantation, but still research in this area continues. But we also have other solutions that need to be explored and some of them are explored. Like for example, the system of organ donations in itself that works so badly, the prevention of disease, which is something that medicine walked away from and now it's realizing that we really need to work on preve prevention of, of, of disease and that would save many, many lives. But also research on um, growing organs, on bioprinting organs, on, uh, on growing organs or pieces of organs in labs that are already helping with some cases of, um, of patients that need one an organ or partial organ. Of course, we are not at a stage where we have um, a heart grown in a lab, but with a myriad of solutions, we can find ways to have better systems of healthcare that can respond to patients' needs without uh, the use of animals. So yes, I do believe it's possible. Thank you. We hope for it as well. Um, we have some recommendations, questions regarding recommendations for the schools and for our students that you can make. And we received questions, question from Spain by email, and we also received a similar question from Italy. Is their teenagers there? in secondary schools and they're asking what they can do to spread awareness about this, what they can do to make a difference, to contribute to this non-animal non science. Yes, yes. Well, I think you're already in a very good place because first you're listening to these chats, you're aware already of the of the work being done uh, by the Joint Research Center itself in this area. Um, what I would, uh, so when I started having an interest in this area, the first thing I did was get informed. And I, and not only get informed from uh, looking at animal advocacy um, uh, materials, of course, you need to read those very carefully, but um, also to understand the, the whole picture, because if you understand the whole picture, if you understand also the researchers' perspectives, it's not only about uh, 
um, animal advocacy or animal science. It's also about non-animal science and it's about all these players and how do they see the problems themselves. And then you yourself with your critical thinking and with the values that you hold, you will be able to think better about okay, what is it or how is it that I want to um, to disseminate this information. Um, making this an issue is very important, of course. Uh, you can always uh, try to organize uh, debates with, uh, with the community, uh, with uh, universities, uh, with uh, other animal advocacy NGOs. Um, but I do think that the first step is um, get yourself informed, look for more information about the topic so that you can decide for yourself how you want uh, to, um, to, to, to tackle this issue. That's very good advice. Thank you. Um, we have a few questions regarding your work per se. Uh, School from Italy is asking, um, you created the software to simulate childbirth and surgical interventions. Do you think that in the future machine and robots could actually take place of uh, replace doctors? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, no, the correct question is never. Huh? But, but um, they do help a lot um, uh, physicians and, uh, and doctors. Because they so besides these uh, the, these educational tools that uh, that are out there in the market to uh, to train medical students, uh, veterinary students, uh, and so on, you also have uh, machines that help, for example, to diag diagnose um, patients. So they help the doctors assess the data to make a diagnosis of the patient. Um, and we, we are getting into a time where information is just too much for a human brain to handle. And so we're uh, also uh, evolving a lot on, uh, on the analysis of big data, getting huge chunks of, uh, of data from, uh, from different patients and individual data from, from, uh, from, from, from one individual to help uh, understand populations and understand a single patient. So to to be able to promote uh, medicines and uh, treatments that are pers personalized to to one patient. That's really one one big area in uh, in medicine today. And machines and these models are of course helping enormously in uh, in achieving uh, in achieving that because it is impossible for a doctor to 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 know without the help of these uh, of these machines um what is the best treatment for that single patient thank you uh before we finish and fi finalize this session i have one final question for you um which is what advice can you give to, to students? Uh, what can, especially to those who choose this as their formative path and how can you encourage them to continue working on uh, creating a non-animal science? So what is your biggest um, go-to message? Um, again, I think with, with the, the risk of repeating myself and um, look for, different things all the time. Open up your doors, different doors to different worlds uh, to understand what is out there. I understand that it is still um, a challenge for universities to um, to be able to pass on knowledge to students that are uh, that are based on the on the um, more recent and advanced models um, in uh, in life sciences. Um, it is a challenge, but uh, it's also important that you challenge your teachers also to, to give you the resources to be able to search yourself and that, well, in today's world, 
virtual world it's uh, it's uh, it's fantastic uh, it's a it's fantastic and the broad world that is waiting for you uh, where you can explore uh, pretty much everything that you want so um, try to broaden your experiences um, beyond the the curriculum of uh, of universities i think that would be a very important step thank you very much uh, do you uh, have any more questions for our expert if not i would then add one or two questions that we also have from before if you uh, don't mind because we have still some time um uh, our students from italy also wanted to know um why do some labs prefer using animal cells instead of uh, human cells that can be more relevant mm -hmm. and faster for us uh well it's uh, it's it's easier also so it's also a question of access and that's uh, and that's that's an issue that really needs to be uh, tackled um, in the EU and uh, and around the world. It's uh, it's still easier to have access to to non-human animals or to human or to animal cells than to have access to to human cells. The the processes are are more difficult. The access is more is more uh, is more difficult, and that's why some researchers uh, usually start with uh, or use simply animal cells in their research, understanding that uh, many times later on they will need to to use human cells, but they do the the, the preliminary work on the animal cells because it's easier. So um, making um, available also banks of cells for, uh, for for human cells it's also extremely an extremely important aspect as it is in general to uh, ensure that researchers have access uh, to uh, to to technologies and models that do not rely on the use of animals which is also a problem because most um, universities and research institutions they do have uh, laboratory animals uh, they have laboratories that are dedicated to 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 have animals for experiments and then on top of that they also have to invest on um, on other laboratories to have other types of, uh, of equipment to conduct in vitro um, in vitro uh, research or in silico uh, based research and this is also a very a very very big problem in the area that access to all the technologies available that can reduce the use of animals are just are not there but sometimes also they are not even known to by the researchers so uh, the 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 efforts for uh, continuous education and uh, and training of um, of researchers is also very important but are these methods affordable they are of course that you're if you're um, adding uh, the cost of having a, um, an animal laboratory uh, on the on the on the other on other laboratories it's uh, it's always more costly because you're going to increase your cost so there's there's not really a shift that is done from uh, from the beginning and that's quite quite natural because people also need time to uh, to adapt and that's also where uh, policies come in and why that's why the 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 models of governance on this topic are so important uh, because we have we have been in a stage right now of a uh, uh, pilot project i don't know if you know this term but it's uh, more or less where uh, where the policies in place are just um, uh, shooting uh, some investments here and there and there, so all over the place to see where the science can uh, can take us. But we are at a place now where science is uh, and the solutions that scientists have come up with are uh, already quite developed. They need a new stage. Now they need to be promoted. They need to be uh, spread. They need to uh, to to be um, to be taken 
in a way that can make them become the new normal with time. And so for this, it's important that governments together and also, of course, the European Commission uh, have concrete uh, targets and objectives to try to have case studies where this transition is done in a coordinated way uh, that can facilitate the work of scientists so that they do not have the burden of having the additional costs of these uh, of these uh, of these new methods they have help in introducing um, education on an animal methods in their curricula um, and uh, and that they they have the funds necessary to also make this transition. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Lithuania. Uh, have you ever needed to do something or find something that you or use some methods that you haven't learned in the university? Yes. <laughs> it's called modeling. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, what um, when you when you enter the world of research, and it's it's interesting because we just um, we just supported a study that also shows <coughs> that that's very very much what happens with uh, with every researcher. Um, the the models that you're going to use are not uh, usually models that you have in the educational curriculum, and I think that. Uh, in part, that has to do also with the complexity of the models that you are going to uh, to use. So usually in your studies, you use something a little bit more simpler. And then when you um, move to research, you're going to ex explore uh, again <clears throat> a broader wor world in the area that you are focusing on. Um, and so, yes, you're always going to learn more. Um, know more about other research teams, other researchers, other publications <coughs> out there that will show you um, other ways of, um, of modeling. And then, of course, um, as, a, as a, a modeler, you're also always creating something new. So you may even use uh, something as a basis that um, that you have learned from another article, but you're always adding uh, new things that do not exist yet. Uh, so you're always working with new models. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and that <laughs> brings us to the end of our chat. Luisa, I would ask you if you have any final remarks for our schools before I thank everyone. Well, um, just that um, again, just don't don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of failing or of making the wrong decision. Because the decision you will make will have a reason if you don't even if you don't understand it very well uh, now and um, and just um, enjoy the ride um, and be be uh, be open, be critical, um, shine. Thank you. Um, we were lucky today to have you as our guest speaker. We also were very lucky to have Marcel Holloway as our speaker. And with that, I want to take all of our 20 schools that attended today, which means a lot of students were reached today. Uh, thank you very much for your amazing questions, for your active participation. You've been all very, very great. And to close this event, I would like to thank our speakers. Thank you all and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.